would drive a screwdriver into their ears and he would twist it. Welcome to Killer Concepts. This is where I'm going to be talking about all things true crime. And today we're going to start with the House of Horrors killer, Gary Heidnick. Gary Heidnick was both a murderer and a rapist. He was actually the last person to be executed in my home state of Pennsylvania. So I just thought that would be a good place to start. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you do not miss any of the episodes that are here to come. I'm going to talk about all things true crime, unsolved and solved mysteries, and you are not going to want to miss it. Also make sure to like, comment, and share this post. So Gary Heidnick was born November 22nd, 1943 in Eastlake, Ohio, but he actually grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. His parents were Michael and Ellen Heidnick. According to Heidnick, he was actually abused throughout his childhood. His dad would beat him and he'd also mock him by making him hang up his soiled bed linens from when he would wet his bed at night for all the neighbors to see. Gary Heidnick was a super social outcast and he was a socially awkward teen. He only made it to his freshman year of high school until he decided to drop out, but then he decided to go and attend the Staunton Military Academy. I hope I'm saying that right. And then he left before graduation and enlisted in the United States Army. Heidnick became a medic in the United States Army for about 14 months until he was medically discharged. And we came to learn that the reason he was discharged, which it was honorably, was due to him having something called schizoid personality disorder. So in case you don't know, I'm going to read you the definition of schizoid personality disorder. So if you see me looking down, that's because I'm reading the definition from Mayo Clinic. So Mayo Clinic defines schizoid personality disorder as an uncommon condition in which people avoid social activities and consistently shy away from interaction with others. They also have a very limited range of emotional expression. So if somebody just really doesn't seem like they have any emotions, symptoms of this condition include lunar or dismissive tendencies, lack of skill or desire to form personal relationships or close relationships. This can be a normal family relationship, this can be friendships, and this can be romantic relationships as well. And you may appear as though you don't care about others or what is going on around you. So you're pretty much in your own bubble and that's just kind of how it's gonna be and you're a little bit of a recluse. So after Heidnick was discharged from the army for having schizoid personality disorder, he actually became a nurse, but it really didn't last long. And then when Heidnick turned 27, around that time, his mother, Ellen Heidnick, then committed suicide. So as you can see, Heidnick, you know, did not start off very good in life in general, and it keeps going kind of downhill from there. So in 1971, Gary Heidnick at age 28 actually started the United Church of the Ministers of God. This he started with only five followers out of his house in Philadelphia and $1,500 as an investment, which when Gary Heidnick is arrested, we'll find out he actually had invested that money very smartly because it grew to $550,000. So five years after Heidnick started the United Church of the Ministers of God, he actually caught his first legal charge. So in 1976, Heidnick actually was charged with shooting a tenant and grazing him in the face. So Heidnick was charged with aggravated assault and carrying an unlicensed firearm after shooting the tenant of a house that he offered for rent. Luckily, this was just a superficial wound and the guy was all right, but it definitely shows us that Heidnick is emotionally and mentally unstable. So in 1978, Heidnick actually committed his first sexually motivated crime. 
Heidnik had signed out his then girlfriend's sister out of a mental institution that she was in. He took her to his home in Philadelphia and kept her in a locked storage room in his basement. After she was found in the hospital, had a chance to take a look at her, it has been reported that she was raped and sodomized. According to Pennsylvania court dockets, Heineck was charged with the following charges. Rape, interference with custody of committed persons, recklessly endangering another person, involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, and kidnapping force threat and deception. When the case went to court, Heidnik was sentenced with three to seven years in prison. But during the appeals process, his charges were actually overturned and he only ended up spending three more years in mental institutions before he was released in 1983. Unfortunately, Heidnik's terror would not stop there. Shortly after he was released, he met his future wife, Betty Disto, through a matrimonial service. You know, she could be considered a mail order bride. Some people say that. The two talked through the matrimonial service for two years before Disto actually came here from the Philippines. So Disto came from the Philippines in 1985 and settled down with Heidnik in his house in Philadelphia, PA. The two then married on October 3rd, 1985 in the state of Maryland. The happiness in their marriage quickly deteriorated. Disto came home one time to find Heidnik in bed with three other women. Heidnik forced her to participate and beat and raped her. The abuse continued and three months later, Disto actually got the courage to leave Heidnik. She originally charged him with spousal rape, but those charges were dropped. After the divorce, Heidnik actually learned that he had gotten Disto pregnant. And how he found out is he just started getting requests for child support. It is not known if they had any sort of relationship and it is not believed that they did. Heinick also had children with two other women who also said that he had very deviant sexual behavior. Gary Heinick's six victims would be made up of Josefina Rivera, age 25, who was kidnapped for 25th, 1986. Sandra Lindsay, age 24, and she was kidnapped on December 3rd, 1986. Then there was Lisa Thomas, age 19, who was kidnapped December 23rd, 1986. Deborah Dudley, age 23, who was kidnapped May 2nd, 1987. Jacqueline Askins, age 18, who was kidnapped on January 18th, 1987. And then there was Agnes Adams, who was age 24, and she was kidnapped on March 23rd, 1987. And luckily, she was actually rescued the same day. The night of her capture, Rivera was working the streets of 3rd and Gerard when Heidnik pulled up to her in his brand new Cadillac. In an interview with the Philadelphia Inquirer, Rivera states that she remembers Heidnik pulling up to her and telling her that she looked like Diana Ross. That night, she actually broke a rule that she never breaks, which means she went back to his house with him, which is something that she did not do for safety reasons. She would usually instead have sex with men in cars or in a nearby alleyway. However, Heidnik wanted to go back to his house on Marshall Street near Tioga in Philadelphia. Here, Rivera had sex with Heidnik for $20, but the night would start down a bad path when he came up behind her and began to choke her. Rivera stated, quote, I passed out. When I came to, he had one of my hands in handcuffs and he was trying to get the other around my back, end quote. This is when Heidnik forced her down to the basement and shackled her limbs together, sealing the bolts with super glue. Heidnik then beat Rivera with a stick and shoved her small body into a pit in the ground of his basement. Here, Rivera could hardly fit. It was super tiny and he boarded it up, trapping her inside. Within the next three months, Rivera will be joined by five other women, two of whom would not survive. One of Heidnik's other survivors, Jackie Askins, also remembered being taken the same way that Josefina Rivera was. She said um, Heidnik stripped her of her clothes, her wig, and everything, and she just remembers screaming. Heidnik then took her to the basement of his home like he did Rivera, and she remembers seeing four other women there. Askin stated, quote, Yeah, they were all tied up, chained up. Two on the bed, one was by the pool table, and one was 
standing up by the window, end quote. Hardnick would also cover their mouth and he would drive a screwdriver into their ears and he would twist it so that the women could not hear his comings and goings. Along with that, he would also have music playing on all levels of his home so that nobody could hear the women's screams. Hardnick would abuse and torture these women. He was trying to get them pregnant. This is something that his own attorney said as well as his survivors. He would beat and have sex with the women every single day and he would keep the woman that he thought was not pregnant for last. Their bathroom was a toilet without plumbing and if the women talked back to him he would beat them with sticks. As time went by Heidnick actually enlarged the hole that was in his basement that he would throw the women in. He made it to about four feet deep. The hole would still only fit three women inside and Rivera, one of his survivors, wanted to make sure that she would be one of the women that would be allowed outside the pit because this was part of her plan that she was concocting in her head in order to escape Heidnick. In order to gain his trust, she started to listen to his ramblings about his childhood and how bad it was. He would tell Rivera about his suicide attempts, his time in the army, psychiatric hospitals, and prison. Rivera wanted to make sure that she was his favorite. Rivera recalls that Heidnick was putting them in a ranking system. The way he would do things all dependent on who he liked most and she wanted to guarantee that she would survive this situation. For this very reason, um, people actually believe that Rivera was Heidnick's accomplice, but there is so much more to it than her just being accomplice. She was a victim. Over time, Heidnick did begin to trust Rivera more than the others, so he took her out of the hole and he handcuffed her to a sewer pipe. And he told her then to watch the other women. In 1987, Heidnick became severely frustrated with Sandra Lindsay, who was mentally disabled. Sandra had issues with her jaws, so every time she tried to eat, it was a struggle. At this point, Heidnick handcuffed Lindsay's wrists to a rafter in the ceiling not very far from the pit in the ground. Rivera remembers her her breathing slowing. She seemed very sick and malnourished. Uh, remember that she really struggled eating, so she was not, not taking in as much as she should have been. Lindsay was getting beat with sticks. Heidnick wanted her to eat, and he could not get her to do that. While Heidnick was hitting Lindsay, she started choking. Heidnick ran to get the keys to unlock her handcuffs. And when he did unlock her handcuffs, her body slid and smacked right into the cement floor of the basement. At this point, Sandra Lindsay was deceased. This would be Heidnick's first murder out of the six girls, be a total of two. Heidnick hoisted Lindsay's limp body upstairs and the women heard what sounded like a chainsaw. The girls smelled a very horrible smell fill the house. And then Heidnick had Deborah Dudley come upstairs. He showed her Lindsay's head in a pot and told her that if she did not get it together, that would be what happened to her. Heidnick then ground up Lindsay's body, he blended Lindsay's body parts with dog food, and he fed it to the women in his basement. The neighbors had actually called the cops on Heidnick as they they reported a putrid smell. And when the cops come, Heidnick just said that he had burned a roast. And the cops had no reason to argue with him about it and they actually left. So at that point, there could have been five women who were saved and could have been kept alive and unfortunately another death would occur because those cops did walk away. Another thing that Heidnick would do to these women is he would fill the hole in the ground with water and he would attach battery cables to it and he would electrocute the women. So two months after Lindsay died, Heidnick murdered one of the women this way. That day Heidnick picked Dudley to torture. He made sure that she was standing in the hole in a few inches of water chained up. He handed Rivera battery cables and he told her to attach them to the chains. Heidnick did the same and Dudley was electrocuted and she died. After this incident, Heidnick actually made Rivera sign a form stating that 
both of them electrocuted Dudley, and this is what got Rivera freed from her chains. Heidink was starting to trust Rivera more and more. He took her with him when he went to bury Dudley. He buried Dudley in the Pine Barrens and then he had told Rivera that he was hungry and so he went to McDonald's. Heidnick kept opening up to her. He was telling her everything. He told her what happened to Lindsay's body and how he had been feeding it to them. He, he became very comfortable and this is what later would save all of the women. Over the next few days after Dudley's death, Heidnick actually took Rivera out with him multiple times. Um, he took her to Denny's, he took her shopping for clothes, and she even slept in his bed. Um, Rivera claims that she wanted him to trust her. She wanted him to believe that she was on his side so that she could get away. Rivera claimed that the reason that she did not run when she was out in public with Heidnick was because she did not want him to kill the other girls because there would be nothing for the cops to find. She wanted to make sure that they would all get out. So she actually went back home with Heidnick. A few days after they went shopping and went to Denny's, Heidnick actually took Rivera with him to find another woman to capture. This is when they picked up Agnes Adams and Rivera said they took her home and they put her in the hole. Uh, to reward Rivera for this, Heidnick actually told her that he would let her see her family and do this she had him drop her off at 6th and Gerard and she told Heidnick that she'd be back in 25 minutes and as soon as Heidnick drove off she ran to a payphone and she dialed 911. Rivera said that the police did not at first believe her um, they thought her story was a little far-fetched but then they did come and they actually arrested Heidnick at the gas station down the street. And then from there they went and they raided his home and friend freed the three other women who were still at Heidnick's house and who were still alive. And all the women finally got to be free after four months of imprisonment and torture by Gary Heidnick. Unfortunately, Sandra Lindsay was 24 and Deborah Dudley who was 23 did not make it out alive. At the time of his arraignment, Heidnick actually tried to say that when he moved in, all the women were already there. We all know that's very far-fetched and did not happen. At the time of Heidnick's final arrest, he had $550,000 in his bank account from the $1,500 that he had invested in the name of the United Church of the Ministers of God that he had started. Heidnick was actually a very intelligent man, and this $550,000 would actually end up working against Heidnick in trial because it would be used to prove his sanity. Heidnick's financial advisor, Robert Kirkpatrick, actually stated that Heidnick was, quote, an astute investor who knew exactly what he was doing, end quote. So according to Heidnick's court dockets that I actually have pulled up right now on my computer for Philadelphia, he has the following charges. Now bear with me because this is a long list and some of them do repeat because he did do it to multiple women. So exactly as it says on his docket sheet, he has a murder in the first degree, rape, kidnapping, forced threat, deception, aggravated assault, simple assault, kidnapping, forced threat, deception, rape, aggravated assault, simple assault, kidnapping, forced threat, deception, kidnapping, forced threat, deception, aggravated assault, simple assault, rape, aggravated assault again, simple assault again, kidnapping, forced threat, deception, involuntary deviate sexual intercourse, rape, rape, kidnapping, forced threat, deception, and then he has murder in the first degree, for Sandra Lindsay and Deborah Dudley. During his trial, Heidnick actually denied any allegations of any mistreatment of his captives. He even claimed that Sandra Lindsay was killed by the other captives for being a lesbian. Apparently, Heidnick claimed that he wanted to be executed because America would stop the death penalty if an innocent man would be put to death. So in 1988, Heidnick was 
convicted of two counts of first degree murder and he was sentenced to death and he was incarcerated in Pittsburgh. In January 1999, Heidnik attempted suicide with an overdose of prescribed Thorazine. And then Heidnik was executed by lethal injection on July 6th, 1999. Now an important note about this for Heidnik, Heidnik was the last person in Pennsylvania to be executed by lethal injection. Uh, Gary Heidnik was a horrible man. He did really terrible things. You can see why he was called the House of Horrors killer. Many people actually believe that Silence of the Lambs, Buffalo Bill was actually partially based on him when it comes to the pit in the ground. If you like this video, please remember to press that red subscribe button. That's really gonna help me out, especially with me being new here on YouTube. Also like the video to show me some support and make sure to leave me comments down there. I'm actually going to leave an email address down there for you to submit case suggestions. And if you have anything that you would like to add about Gary Heidnick or any cases that I'm going to cover in the future. I will be posting a episode of Killer Concepts once a week as well as a couple other episodes here and there, but that'll be more adventure oriented. So after watching this, I want you to remember to stay safe out there and always remember that the world's most dangerous minds hide in the most unlikely places.